Welcome to the IEEE Computer Society's Distinguished Lecturer Webinar Series, where some of the past 50 years' top tech leaders and innovators provide trusted, high-quality, and state-of-the-art information through presentations that reach a global audience. This webinar series is brought to you by the Distinguished Visitors Program, a global speakers portal that puts our distinguished visitors' knowledge and skills center stage. If you have expert knowledge, skills, and abilities, coupled with a record of technical and or academic successes in any area relating to computing or information technology, let other industry and academic leaders hear what you have to say. Join us now as a distinguished visitor. Although we're looking for experts in all areas, this year the following fields are of particular interest. Artificial intelligence, pattern recognition, security and privacy, quantum computing, image processing, visualization and graphics. Selection is competitive. Nominate yourself or someone else. The deadline for the receipt of nominations is November 3rd, and the program year begins on January 1st. You can find more information at www.computer.org slash distinguished-visitors. You can also contact Carrie Cosby at k.cosby at computer.org. Hello, everyone, joining us around the world, and welcome to the Distinguished Lecturer Webinar Series. Before we go any further, my name is Carrie Cosby, and I'm the Chapters Manager here at the IEEE Computer Society. I oversee our more than 500 professional and student chapters around the world and manage our Distinguished Visitors Program. Before we get started, I'd like to get a couple of housekeeping tasks out of the way. You can ask your questions of Dr. Uh, Duarte. At the end of the presentation, he'll try to get as many questions as he can. When you're writing your questions, please make certain that uh, you, if you're writing them in the middle of, a, of the presentation, please make certain that you let us know which slide you're talking about, which topic you're talking about. Uh, the webinar is being recorded and the slides and recording will be made available after the webinar. I'd like to introduce our speaker Carlos Enrique Cabral Duarte, um, who has more than 30 years of professional experience in engineering, finance, and management, teaching and research devoted to the theory and practice of information and software technologies. He's currently a strategic advisor to the Directorate of Research of the Brazilian Institute of Statistics and Geography, on leave from his role as a technical staff member at the Brazilian Development Bank in Rio de Janeiro. Lately at the BNDES, he has served as financing anal analyst of accredited machines, equipment, components, and systems. Carlos Enrique Duarte uh, also has an academic career. He worked as a lecturer in the Brazilian universities and was a research fellow of the Brazilian NSF. He's written, reviewed, and edited many papers and scientific journals and conferences. Dr. Duarte holds a PhD from Imperial College London, an MSc from PUC Rio, and an M a BMath in computing. Dr. Duarte, I'd like to pass the floor to you. Thank you so much, Kerry, for your introduction and for also for organizing this webinar. I'm uh, to be here this afternoon. Uh, and uh, the subject of this talk will be uh, regulatory compliance uh, and uh, process improvement in healthcare. Uh, I wish to greet everybody, everyone uh, joining us. And uh, I would like to uh, say that although today I'm with the Brazilian Institute of Statistics, most of the research I will discuss with you today uh, was developed, developed when I was uh, at the Brazilian Development Bank. I have been a member of the Computer Society for almost 30 years. In 2012, I was uh, elevated to the senior grade member. And uh, since uh, 2018, I have been a distinguished uh, visitor of the Computer Society. I'm so glad that the Computer Society uh, 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 arranged these uh, webinars so that we can share with you, with, with you our knowledge on specific uh, subjects. 
Today, I'm um, uh, uh, based in Rio de Janeiro, which appears uh, down there in this uh, map. And uh, Brazil is a big country. Uh, it uh, is in South America. And uh, I will be uh, discussing with you today uh, some aspects of our healthcare system. Although uh, this discussion is regarding the Brazilian healthcare system and regulatory compliance here, I hope uh, the lessons uh, and uh, the aspects of this healthcare system will be interesting uh, to you all over the world. So, uh, because of there may be uh, similarities with your uh, the healthcare system in your own countries, uh, this talk is almost like a tutorial. Uh, up to the half of the talk, the webinar, uh, we will see a lot of detail. And in the second half, we are going to uh, discuss some findings and takeaways, OK? I will begin with a description of the Brazilian uh, health care equipment regulation and go on with uh, some uh, presentation of the uh, research data and methodology using used in the reported research. Uh, later on, we are going to see some uh, research findings regarding regulatory compliance. And later on, we are going to uh, discuss some process improvement cases. And uh, finally, we will have some uh, discussions, discussions on uh, learned lessons and some takeaways, OK? Before I begin uh, with the uh, uh, regulatory compliance subject here, I wish to share with you uh, an overview of the Brazilian healthcare ecosystem. Uh, over here, we have a health assistance network, which, is, uh, which comprises uh, public, uh, private, and philanthropic hospitals and clinics. These also rely on uh, service providers, which uh, provide, uh, for instance, clinical exams or diagnostic imaging uh, uh, diagnosis. And uh, these institutions also perform uh, internally or in cooperation some uh, research development and innovation activities, right? Uh, we call this uh, health assistance network a universal one because um, any Brazilian, any person living here can decide where to receive treatment. If the person has a health plan or is uh, capable of paying for its treatment, uh, it can go to public hospitals, uh, pr private hospitals and clinics. But on the other hand, anyone can rely on um, the public uh, uh, hospitals and clinics to receive treatment. Uh, these uh, institutions, they work uh, relying on a supply chain which goes on and on backwards. For instance, uh, these hospitals and clinics, they use uh, imported uh, health care care equipment, right? And uh, of course, we have here also some manufacturers of healthcare, healthcare products. And uh, there are some uh, relationships of the foreign companies with the local ones. Uh, we have many companies here which are owned by foreign companies. They have uh, a share in their capital. But the foreign companies uh, sometimes contribute with uh, components or technology which is used by these local com companies, OK? Uh, local companies also uh, use uh, components and services provided uh, by local companies. And the, the uh, government here has a, a heavy hand on this sector because it's the main consumer of healthcare products. And the uh, government also uh, is also responsible for all the regulation regarding healthcare products. There is the Ministry of Health which is in charge of uh, formulating the regulations. And uh, in, particularly, in particular, uh, there is uh, the health uh, regulatory agency, Anvisa, which is responsible for sanitary control. Uh, 
And Visa is also responsible for providing uh, certificates of good manufacturing practices, which are needed by uh, uh, local manufacturers to produce their uh, equipment here. There are some other uh, public institutions uh, re related to this ecosystem. For instance, uh, we have here one Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovation, uh, which provides uh, tax benefits together with the Ministry of Development, Industry and Commerce. And uh, there is the institution where I work or I used to work and I'm now on leave of absence, the Brazilian Development Bank. Uh, local manufacturers organize themselves in associations uh, uh, or to be more specific in an association and uh, uh, union so that they can keep their uh, dialogue with the government and with all the stakeholders, right? So uh, healthcare is very important uh, here in Brazil as it is in any other country in the world because of the uh, social and economic uh, 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 contributions. Healthcare is so important that the United Nations Development Program defined uh, some uh, sustainable development goals which were subscribed by all the uh, member states of the United Nations in 2015. Despite the importance of uh, healthcare uh, in any country, it is a heavily regulated sector. And regulations of the healthcare uh, sector can be uh, seen as a good thing or as a bad thing, depending on your perspective, right? Uh, it, uh, healthcare uh, regulation is important and it, it's good uh, when it, it ensures public health care and corporate benefits or advantages. But on the other hand, uh, the healthcare regulation sometimes is considered uh, excessive. Uh, sometimes uh, it is costly to achieve uh, regulation compliance, and sometimes uh, the regulation. Uh, affects uh, time to market, okay? Uh, another important uh, aspect of the healthcare re regulations uh, is that sometimes they are goal-oriented. Co-orientation means that the regulation uh, proposes to maximize its benefits whenever uh, the manufacturer uh, ensures the achievement of some uh, established uh, poli public policy goals, okay? So goal-oriented goal regulations are a subject of interest in this talk. Moreover, um, many regulatory texts like uh, laws, like uh, standards and contracts of compulsory compliance, they frequently refer to uh, systems and software requirements. And these are also important because uh, the beginning of this research was at that point where we were wondering if uh, there were connections between uh, regulatory compliance and technical requirements in healthcare regulations. Uh, and in, particularly, in particular, we were inter interested in analyzing what we call time to benefit measures. For instance, uh, time to market is a kind of time to benefit uh, measure. And uh, the interest was in determining if uh, time to benefit measures were related to the technical requirements included in the regulation. So it, it appeared to be worthwhile uh, studying this subject. And in order to answer this kind of question, we conducted an exploratory case study uh, studying the times required by each company to uh, uh, obtain benefits due to their compliance with the healthcare regulation here. And we performed one uh, empirical study uh, considering healthcare equipment process, uh, companies here established in Brazil with businesses in the diagnostic imaging equipment uh, segment. This is a very important market segment, uh, and um, the cost of each equipment is high. Their importance in uh, producing uh, 
uh, exams or diagnostics is high. And um, also, the Brazilian uh, market and regulation appear to be uh, relevant. The Brazilian internal market is of a considerable size. For instance, uh, just to give you an example, in the decade ending in 2017, uh, we observed more than 1,700 sales of diagnostic imaging equipment. And this was worth, uh, this, their sales were worth at least half a billion dollars. So the market uh, has a relevant size. And also the regulation here is uh, similar to that uh, you can find in your own countries and in most parts of the world. So we thought it would uh, be interesting to study this uh, subject, not only because of the Brazilian market, but considering the whole situation of this sector in, in the world. So let me give you some examples of uh, diagnostic imaging equipment. X-rays are a kind of uh, 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 diagnostic imaging equipment. They come with an X-ray tube and detectors and also with a table, which is used in exams. But uh, there are some other uh, equipment which are analog to X-rays, like mammographs, which are used to make, uh, to produce images of women's breasts or even angiographs, which take uh, X-ray pictures of your veins, of, uh, of your uh, heart, while they are walking, they are uh, pulsating and beating, okay? Uh, normally, we regard X-ray equipment as the simplest uh, of this kind. Uh, in another level of complexity, you can find ultrasound equipment, which come with uh, as a specific component, which is the, the transducer, that part of the ultrasound equipment, which uh, is in contact with your body to produce live images in the stream of a kind of computer connected to the transducer. And they are very important also because they produce live images of your body and their cost is not so high. But uh, some exams you cannot uh, perform with using ultrasound, so sometimes you rely on uh, computerized uh, tomography equipment. Those ones which come with that uh, circular bo uh, bore or so-called uh, gantries, that part of the equipment uh, into which um, a table with a floating top moves your body inside it so that you can uh, uh, be examined. And the uh, principle here is the same, the same as in X-ray equipment. There are detectors and there are X-ray tubes so that the, you, the image is generated uh, of your body. But the most complex one are MRI equipment, ma magnetic uh, resonance equipment, which are based on a different uh, operation principle. They have a uh, superconducting magnet inside them and the magnet is, is used to polarize all the water molecules inside your body in a way that uh, if uh, your body is inserted into the gantry of the equipment and uh, uh, the equipment uh, emits some radio frequency signals, whenever they are detected uh, inside the equipment, an image of your body is created also, and the resolution of those images uh, is uh, very good. So these are the equipment we studied, uh, we study here, and uh, we also had another purpose in mind. Not only we wanted to discover if there were connections between technical requirements and regulatory compliance, but we were also interested in uh, determining if uh, uh, regulatory compliance and regulatory processes themselves could be uh, better understood and improved in order to uh, answer this kind of question we wondered if we could adopt uh, so-called uh, process mining techniques so a different kind of technique was used in our analysis ana analysis and uh, we found out two process improvement cases. 
that were uh, exemplifying this application of process mining in healthcare regulatory processes. Uh, and those ones I wanted to share with you also. They will be presented uh, in the second half of this talk. So the main principle, the main interest in studying uh, regulatory uh, process improvement was to uh, reach a better balance between the, regula the regulation obligations and the benefits granted to companies, okay? So um, this was also uh, our interest here. As I said, uh, we have here a regulatory compliance agency and visa, which is similar to the American uh, Food and Drug Administration Agency, FDA there, and it is responsible for formulating all the sanitary control measures on the production, usage of, uh, and marketing of uh, healthcare products. Uh, here in Brazil, we also have the ministries granting, uh, formulating, analyzing, and granting tax benefits to the industry. And the Brazilian uh, Development Bank is the main source of funding to the healthcare sector. So we decided to study this, the, the three regulations uh, that these uh, government agencies take care of. Sanitary regulatory, sanitary, sanitary control regulations, financial incentive regulations, and tax benefit regulations. So we are going to enter into uh, the details of this regulation next. Uh, concerning sanitary control measures, the most important uh, thing that needs to be done is registry, registration of your equipment so that you can uh, uh, expose it for sale, you can commercialize it, you can uh, uh, use it in your uh, operation, right? And registry requires an authorization of the competent authorities. And uh, by registering an equipment, uh, its name, uh, manufacturer, description, components, and so on are uh, recorded in a kind of book by the regulatory agency and visa. Nowadays, this is done uh, completely in an electronic way. And uh, this is like a bookkeeping. Uh, the agency keeps books containing all the important aspects of those uh, equipment. But not only that, uh, the, agency, the regulatory agency also has to uh, keep track of the validity of the regulations for how long each registry, registry is uh, valid. Here, uh, registries are valid for five years, and uh, it is possible to revalidate a registry and the registry of some uh, equipment uh, comes into force only after its publication in the official press, right? Uh, there are, the regulation also poses some requirements on the companies complying with uh, the registry regulation. Uh, for instance, they are required to provide evidence of their industrial activities, uh, the nature and species of the products, and they have to provide some insurance of their technical, uh, scientific, and operational capacity. But not only that, these companies, these uh, healthcare equipment companies, they also have to keep qualified personnel. personnel uh, in order to take care of their production, production activities. And uh, as in any other part of the world, the regulation here uh, classifies medical products and healthcare equipment according to the level of risk they offer to customers, to patients, and to the operator, right? The uh, categories the classes of risk here are from level one to level uh, four. A thermometer, for instance, doesn't offer any risk to the user, so it is classified in level one. But uh, MRI equipment, for instance, it, it offers uh, some risks 
and consequently they're classified in level three. But the, the highest uh, risk uh, equipment are those which are invasive. And uh, just to give you an example, which is uh, related to the current COVID outbreak, uh, pulmonar ventilators, they are classified in level four because they are invasive. You have to put a tube in the patient's throat so that it can receive artificial uh, respiration, uh, ventilation, sorry. And uh, also, uh, the manufacturer, in order to ensure some traceability of the uh, equipment, they have to stamp in the, the surface of the equipment, the equipment identification, uh, their serial numbers, their registration numbers and the manufacturer name. So this is necessary for any company to commercialize their products here in Brazil. But uh, uh, registry is the, the first step in a very uh, complex chain of uh, regulatory compliance. Another level is related to the financial incentive regulation, which is enforced here. And the main, uh, as I said, the main source of funding is the Brazilian Development Bank here in Brazil. And uh, it, it relies on the workers, workers' assistance fund to provide funding. And because of that, uh, funding can only be provided to projects or products which have some local content or which comply with we call what, what we call here basic production processes, PPBs, right? Uh, and this is because uh, these activities, the compliance with the local content of, with PPBs is supposed to generate more jobs here. And with that, the Workers' Assistance Fund uh, would become more happy, happier. And um, in order to ensure these uh, conditions, the Brazilian Development Bank performs accreditation activities, which is the uh, official recognition that the company has the manufacturer status and the product is a machine, is either a machine, a, an equipment, a component, or industrial system. And um, this, this is not, not always is achieved by manufacturers. Some manufacturers, uh, they have some difficulty in presenting evidence of their industrial activities here in the country. And sometimes they have their requests uh, denied rejected. And also, it's not always simple to characterize one product as a machine, an equipment, a component, or an industrial system. Let me give you an example. Uh, for instance, consumables are frequently used in hospitals and clinics, but they cannot be accredited because they are not any machine, equipment, component, or, or system, right? And even some medical devices like prostheses, which you can use to substitute some broken bone, they cannot be accredited as well for the same reason, right? So uh, BNDES uh, has uh, some regulation regarding the accreditation process. And uh, it requires a lot from manufacturers like to take uh, uh, quality control activities, like to provide warranty, like to be responsible for the product price and provide technical assistance, and so on and so forth. Another important aspect to the Brazilian government is the protection of intellectual property rights. Without that kind of uh, commitment, uh, it is impossible to provide uh, funding to any company. And, of course, uh, companies are expected to sell with the Brazilian Development Bank support only accredited products, right? And uh, the accreditation process, process um, it has two criteria 
to accredit some product apart from the compliance with those items I've just presented. Uh, a product can be accredited if it, uh, it, is, it attains uh, some indexes, it, if it, uh, some indexes are reached in the equipment uh, production, or if uh, a basic production process is followed in the equipment production, right? So here in this slide, I have the details of this accreditation criteria. The index attainment uh, criterion, uh, it has two parts. One which has to do with a value index, which is computed uh, by determining, determining the cost of the imported con content in the product in comparison to the sales price. And there is a weight index also, which is computed uh, by comparing the weight of important, com important uh, components in relation to the total weight of the product, right? If a product uh, reaches 60% in both of those indexes, then it can be accredited according to this criterion. But information technologies, uh, information technology products, they can also be accredited according to a different criterion, which has to do with the compliance with some production steps and some conditions in uh, specific regulations which are passed by the Brazilian government, right? Uh, when I give this talk, people usually ask me uh, how to classify healthcare equipment. They, they, do they look more like a forklift uh, truck, which is in the upper part of this slide, or to a computer. And my answer to these people is normally that it depends on the amount of electronics embedded in the product, right? If there is some electri electronic in electronics, digital electronics embedded in the product, then it can be accredited according to the TPB criteria. If it doesn't, then the only option is to uh, try to reach those 60% percent, percent, uh, indexes, right? For uh, just giving me a, a bit more concrete example, for instance, an X-ray may be digital. It may have digital detectors of X-ray, or it may be analog. The detectors that don't have any electronics at all. So if the X-ray is digital, then it can it can be accredited according to any of these criteria. But if it is analog, then it can only be accredited according to the index attainment uh, criteria. Uh, as you could see, uh, the information technology industry is so important to Brazil and to many other countries that uh, there, is the, there is a specific legislation, regulation here, here regarding this sector and uh, it it ensures tax benefits to manufacturers so long as they uh, fulfill two conditions. They have to follow uh, basic production processes in, their, uh, uh, in producing and manufacturing their equipment, or and uh, these companies must invest some, a part of their revenues in research, development, and innovation activities here. Right. There are some uh, decrees which regulate this subject and uh, the specific basic production processes which are admitted here, they are a subject of ministerial ordinances and uh, companies can claim tax rebate by submitting their requests to the minute, both ministries of science and technology and of develop, development uh, industry and commerce. And as soon as they get their tax benefit approved, uh, a specific ordinance is published in the official press, right? I will go into details later on in this talk. But uh, what is important here is that uh, any information technology product can be manufactured according to a generic basic production process. And this generic basic production process requires that all the uh, components 
are inserted in printed circuit boards here locally, and they are welded. They are, they pass into a soldering uh, process so as to attach those components to the PCBs. And uh, the electrical and mechanical parts must be locally uh, uh, mounted. And uh, this is what we call a generic production process. But there are also uh, specific ones, those which are uh, uh, related to the specific uh, healthcare equipment I mentioned, uh, for instance. CT equipment have their own production process, magnetic and resonance equipment, Doppler ultrasound and fixed and mobile x-rays. And these are regulated in specific ordinances. And of course, they are different uh, one in relation to the other. And uh, these uh, ordinances, they uh, focus on the critical components of each equipment. For instance, as I said, uh, the critical component of X-rays are their emission tubes and their detectors. So the uh, mounting the connections of uh, to the X-ray emission tubes and the assembly of the detectors are considered the most important parts of the production process of these equipment, and that's why the respective respective ordinance requires that requires that it, it is performed here in Brazil. For ultrasound equipment, since the transducer is the most important component, so there's a requirement to, uh, to produce they locally. And also, in this case, that the signal detection processing and output functions, PCBs with these functions, are mounted locally, right? And in the case of MRI equipment, since they are so complex, the two requirements are simple to understand. Uh, a company can, know, uh, can uh, assemble the magnets locally and fold the hydrogen inside uh, into the gantry of the equipment so as to cool this magnet. And because of that, it becomes superconducting. And these are the two parts of the production process that must be performed locally. All these ordinances also require that a soft software is uh, installed and configured uh, locally, and also that uh, computers, printers, and power uh, mag 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 management uh, components are acquired locally according to the respective uh, PPBs, right? So with that, I've uh, finished the first half of the talk, and now we are going to the methodology and the findings of these uh, studies, right? Uh, we were interested only in the diagnostic imaging equipment in the studies we carried out, and uh, we collected all the data regarding this, their sales available within BNDS, and that uh, was quite a, a high uh, number. Uh, nearly 60% of all the sales of uh, diagnostic imaging equipment were um, financed by the bank. And uh, we also queried, requested from companies, from manufacturers, that they uh, provide other sales which were not uh, financed. And later on, uh, taking into account those equipment, we also gathered some information from and some administrative records from other sources, which are available in the internet. The Brazilian uh, institutions which deal with those data, they provide their uh, their records online. That was so regarding the accredited companies, which are. Uh, uh, published in the Brazilian Development Bank uh, website. The registered uh, companies with uh, Anvisa, the sanitary control agency here, and those which have an habilitation, the authorization to use tax benefits, they were also available online. Of course, we had to make some adjustments because data was not always uh, consistent uh, uh, when we take uh, different sources 
into account. We had to clear also situations in which um, there were major and acquisition processes happening in a certain period. And we applied a temporal filter because the regulation was not always like that I presented you before. Uh, there were some changes before 2007, and uh, there were, was not uh, data available from 2018 onwards. So we chose to collect data only in the period from 2008 to 2017. And in the end, although I had access to 52 companies, only nine were analyzed because these were the local uh, manufacturers and they could or could not comply with PPPs. They could or could not be accredited by the Brazilian Development Bank. So the, the data regarding those uh, uh, regulations was analyzed with a focus on the specific events that happened throughout the life cycle of each equipment. And uh, we were uh, concerned with the date of establishment of particular PPBs, uh, the dates in which tax benefits were granted to a company, and the dates in which registrations happened. And uh, also the dates of accreditation of uh, equipment, right? And finally, the dates in which they were sold, these equipment, with or without financing. And uh, we were not so interested in the dates themselves, but in the differences between dates in order to capture those time to benefit measures I was mentioning before. For instance, we were concerned with what we call tax rebate time to benefit measure, which is the time from the establishment of a PPP until the date in which the company obtained uh, the tax rebate authorization. Uh, moreover, we were concerned with the credit time to benefit measure, measure, which is the, the time taken for the company since the registry until the accreditation of the company, of the product, really. And the time taken from the company since the registry until the first sales, time to market or market entry time to benefit, right? We analyzed all these data using what we call factorial design, uh, by computing a correlation matrix. And uh, of course, some of these measures were uh, related, correlated by definition. So we looked into the other uh, correlations, right? If there were any. Uh, observations of those measures were uh, statistically independent from one another. And that allowed us to perform uh, statistical tests our data wasn't uh, uh, normally distributed, and because of that, we had to adopt some non-parametric uh, statistical tests. And uh, there were also groups of equipment, for instance, all the X-ray equipment, all the CT equipment. We were uh, interested in distinguishing in what regards their um, time to benefit measures. Uh, the, the distinctions between those equipment, the equipment in those categories. If there were uh, distinctions in the categories one uh, in relation to each other, right? And uh, if we had the data normally distributed, we could, could have adopted a standard parametric uh, test, but unfortunately that wasn't the case and we had to adopt then uh, so-called cross-call whales tests. And these tests group equipment according to their average ranks. And these tests uh, presume that the newer hypothesis is that no, no group has a distinction in relation to, each, uh, to all the others. And the main hypothesis is that there is a specific group which is distinct from the rest. And then we performed a... Uh, um, post hoc analysis, an analysis 
which is um, which is um, done after uh, the tests, the statistical tests, right? And we use the, in all our analysis uh, the significant city level of uh, 5%, right? So we run a tax rebate time to benefit uh, test in order to determine if tax rebate depends on the technical requirements in the uh, specific diagnostic imaging equipment regulation. We had 54 observations arranged in five groups, and we computed the next H statistics with five, four degrees of freedom. And uh, the statistical test uh, gave rise to a p-value, a very low p-value, smaller than our significance level. So this was a confirmation of the main hypothesis. And by running afterwards the post hoc uh, analysis, we found out that the ultrasound equipment uh, was different from the CT equipment and then MRI equipment put together as a group. And those two were different from the equipment uh, manufactured according to the generic uh, production process. You can see it here in this box plot. And uh, Uh, in this box plot, uh, you can see in the uh, horizontal axis the categories of, comp of equipment in the analysis, and in the vertical uh, axis, the time to benefit measure. As you can see, uh, sometimes it's quite high, and even the average is very high. For instance, in the generic uh, basic production process uh, case, they could take 2,000 days as an average, which is uh, almost uh, unacceptable, right? For the more complex uh, equipment, then the average was uh, the mean, in fact, the median was not so high. The median, you can see as a, a square box inside each, each bear, each green bear, bar. And uh, I have a final comment regarding this uh, graph here, this plot here, is which is that, we didn't have so many fixed X-ray and mobile X-ray uh, in our samples. And uh, because of that, we have uh, we had to group them together in our analysis. And uh, I, will, I will make some other comments later on, right? Uh, before that, let me present you the other uh, statistical texts, te uh, tests we, we did. We also analyzed uh, these uh, uh, measures in what regards uh, credit, time to benefit, the times taken from companies to, since they are registered with Anvisa until they are accredited with the Brazilian Development Bank. And there were 15 observations in this kind, in this case, uh, grouped in, 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 in five groups. There is an additional group here, which I will explain to you in a moment. But uh, anyway, we computed the net H uh, statistics with five degrees of freedom, consequently. And unfortunately, our p-value was not so, uh, was very high. And uh, this correspond to, corresponds to a situation in which uh, the main hypothesis could, couldn't be confirmed. We were not able to confirm the main hypothesis in this case, and because of that, the statistic, the only statistical conclusion is that there isn't so much difference between these groups. And this is, and you can see it here by looking at each of those uh, yellow bars in this box plot here. You can see that variance is very high, and mean uh, value, me, the medians in each case were almost similar in relation one, into, uh, one in relation to the other one. And uh, that's uh, 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 ev evidence that uh, the main hypothesis doesn't hold in this case. Finally, we, we run a third statistics regarding uh, what we call market entry, time to benefit measures. And uh, this is precisely a uh, time to market, considering as a baseline the date of uh, 
registry of the equipment. And as the final date, the equipment uh, sale. So again, in this case, you have a lot of variance and uh, because of that variance, high variance, um, the main hypothesis could not be confirmed. I promised uh, that I would explain the sixth uh, group here in these box plots. And they appear here because some equipment, they're accredited and they are, um, they enter into market complying with the BNDS accreditation criteria, not following any produ basic production process. So in the uh, bar uh, on your uh, right, you can see few equipment which was not complying with the PPBs here. And uh, they're, they were not significantly, uh, they are not statistically uh, significant in our analysis. We couldn't find any distinction on those also. So there were some threats to the validity of those studies. We adopted many uh, divergent uh, data sources. We had to clear those by uh, requesting more data from manufacturers. Uh, our um, our data collect collection procedures follow a, a sequential procedure, not random sampling. And uh, we had to deal with major and acquisition processes here in Brazil. And concerning uh, the sequential procedure adopted in our research, uh, I would say that that was not so relevant in this case because we were studying the Brazilian regulation and we didn't have much hope that this study could be generalized to other countries as it was uh, performed. Uh, regarding the adjustments, uh, they had to do with major acquisitions. And so uh, we were uh, just uh, looking at some legal procedures, not operational ones, and they didn't affect our analysis, right? We weren't concerned with the uh, general validity of this study, just the validity of that in the Brazilian case. You could see here that uh, the level of abstraction of those studies was very low. And uh, that made the regulatory process uh, hidden underneath the statistical models and analysis which we adopted. So we wondered if we could use process mining, which is a different technique in relation to statistical analysis, to uh, describe and to improve those regulatory processes. Process mining is a different uh, technique, and it is based on an information or based on information flows instead of in specific events, right? So the focus of this kind, this kind of analysis is the case, uh, the execution of a process. And uh, an activity is a task which is performed in a case. An event is an isolated event corresponding to the occurrence of the process. And finally, a trace is a sequence of events. So we analyze this uh, data again, but now taking into account a different perspective, uh, the, the point of view of a fl information flow process. And uh, what we studied in this case was the life cycle of the equipment in what regards its compliance with all these regulations, right? So we derived from the same data set a different uh, uh, kind of information, which is, which is the event log containing 62 cases corresponding to 62 different equipment and 251 events corresponding to, to those registration, accreditation, habilitation, and sales events. Uh, there is a public, uh, uh, publicly available tool uh, to perform process mining, which is called PROM, the PROM toolkit. And it adopts, in order to import the event logs, an IEEE uh, standard, uh, the extensible event stream uh, standard. And uh, we also use a different tool, apart from the importation one, which is the pro uh, causal activity discovery tool. And by using this tool, we could derive this model, 
which makes a lot more clear what we were studying, the process we were studying before using those statistics. And this is a state-based uh, diagram. It has two perspectives. We decided to split it in two perspectives because the actors here are different in each perspective. At the top, you can see uh, the, the process from the perspective of the government, and uh, it is related to the establishment of a basic production process. This is performed by a government agencies here, uh, the ministries I mentioned to you before. And the, the second half of this model has to do with the life cycle of a uh, product. Uh, beginning with its possibly beginning with this, its registry with Anvisa and later on with uh, the tax rebate habilitation and later on with the BNDES accreditation. And the state transitions uh, lead to the sales events with or without a financing, right? So that's the end state of, in this uh, perspective of this model. And that was quite, uh, we were quite happy to discover this process model. And the next step in this activity, since we have a map of the process, what about improving them, the, the process, improving it? So that was our next step. We worked towards uh, reducing uh, benefit uh, uh, granting processes and to increase uh, efficacy of the corresponding public policies. So within BNDS, we performed this process mining and also some requirement elicitation activities. Later on, we changed the regulation uh, regarding, accredita uh, regarding accreditation. And finally, we implemented, uh, we, we made a digital transformation of the, the, the submission analysis uh, processes, right? Using software for that. This is the digitalization. So uh, we changed the uh, indexes a company have to attain in order to use just one index, not sure the value and weight. We got rid of the weight index and started using product structure in this index together with some uh, elective quantifiers. If a company meets some quantifier, then it gets a bonus in the computation of the index. And we also implemented automated systems and eliminated all the paperwork. I will let you know the consequences of those in a moment. But Meanwhile, there was also a, a different process improvement attempt within the ministries of industry, commerce, and uh, uh, trade, and the, the Ministry of uh, Innovation, Technology, and Science, which had to do with a discussion of the Brazilian government with the Japanese government and the European ones in what regards the compliance of the PPB uh, regulation with international trade agreements. They were discussing these uh, for many years, and in 2019, in the beginning of the year, the appealato, appealable sorry, body of the World Trade Organization settled this, this discussion by considering that uh, the PPB regulation was admissible, provided some changes in the uh, tax uh, rebate uh, computation. And also that they also considered that the recursive definitions of PPBs uh, in the definitions in PPB establishment ordinances should be eliminated. So there were that they considered that the two changes were necessary. So the uh, ministries uh, changed uh, those uh, regulations. Uh, uh, from a specific production tax, which I, I hadn't mentioned yet, uh, to general tax credits. And uh, they also revised all the ordinances having to do with PPVs. And they adopted in these, this cha last change a scoring procedure, which is, which is very similar to the BNDS accreditation criteria. So uh, as lessons learned from th those uh, process improvement cases, we, we could see that uh, the usage of a new accreditation criteria and the use usage of qualifiers 
and in particular the possibility to uh, use uh, to uh, comply with all the accreditation quantifiers is a good thing as we could hear from the Brazilian manufacturer associations also the practice of publish public publishing public consultations before revising the PPB ordinances was considered a good practice and I think this should be kept. And we also determined that it could be possible, it, it can be possible, it, it is possible to formulate a new PPB uh, ordinance covering all the commonalities between the PPBs I mentioned to you before, so as to group all those requirements in just one more simple ordinance. And the, this has been done here in Brazil regarding, for instance, telecommunication equipment or industrial automation equipment, but it hasn't been done regarding a healthcare uh, equipment. That could be done, and we've already suggested the, that uh, change to the competent authorities. So we've, uh, with these, we also reduced, uh, substantially reduced the times of analysis of accreditation requests and also of tax benefit uh, approval. I know that for a fact. And uh, those, instead of taking months or even years, nowadays they take days. So that is a huge benefit to the industry here. And also this process uh, keeps going with changes in particular ordinances by the respective ministries. So uh, these were the particular uh, lessons we learned, but there were also general ones. Uh, this process improvement uh, business, it increases cooperation between the stakeholders. So that was an important finding. Also, uh, the regulations, when they are goal oriented, they could be improved, they can be improved. And in the particular case I presented to you, uh, they were made more data oriented than goal driven. So uh, we expect to be uh, more uh, in compliance with public policy goals here. And uh, the regulation by these discussions, continuous discussions, they become more straightforward, more transparent, and more enforceable, right? As I said, um, the main consequence of all those uh, process improvement activities was that we expect to uh, obtain more effectiveness of the public policies regarding the healthcare equipment process, the healthcare equipment here in Brazil. That is to say that a process improvement within governments, uh, within companies in, in society, it, it can be a continuous process. It, it, it can be a continuous improvement process, right? So we expect to make more improvements as time passes. And uh, with that, I will finish with the key takeaways of this study. Sometimes we determine that uh, time to benefit measures are dependent on technical requirements in the regulations. Uh, manufacturers should be concerned not only with uh, their compliance with regulations, but also with, the re uh, with regulation dynamics, because of course regulation changes and it is important to keep a track of the regulation to ensure compliance, right? Governments also can use process mining uh, uh, techniques in their process improvements. And uh, this is done not only to improve regulatory compliance, but also to uh, try to guarantee cost effectiveness and broader accessibility goals in healthcare. If a company has better benefits and if there is an impact in cost and in price, maybe the manufacturers can transfer these uh, prices by giving discounts or reducing their prices so that that would uh, benefit the whole society. And that's the final message here. Society is uh, the one who wins with all those uh, process improvements, right? So this work has been published. A summary appeared in the IEEE International uh, Engineering, Medicine and Biology Conference last year. 
I went to Germany to present that. More recently, a paper was published in the IEEE Access Journal. It is an online journal. You have free access to that paper. And regarding digital transformation in companies, society, and in governments, I, I published a paper with a friend, Christoph Eber, in the IEEE magazine. There you can find two other process improvement cases in the healthcare domain, those which are interest, interesting, but a bit more specific. And as a reference to process mining, I would uh, suggest reading of Professor Will van der Oost's uh, book, Process Mining. I'm obliged to make this final legal uh, comment here that I'm the sole uh, responsible for the opinions and the analysis presented today. And the uh, photos were taken and graphs, some of them taken from the internet. And I'm so glad to have this opportunity to be here and to make this presentation. So I thank you all, all of you, who stood with us until uh, now. And I wish to thank the Computer Society for the uh, Distinguished Visitors Program. And also the I3-4E uh, Region 9 uh, uh, team, because they are the guys who organize these talks in this uh, part of the world, in, the, in Latin America. I have traveled to many countries to provide talks like this. And I leave here my contact data on the internet, Twitter, LinkedIn, and email if you wish to make any contact. And I, now I know that uh, Carrie will host a question and answers uh, session. For, uh, so I wish to thank you and pass the ball again to Carrie for this uh, session. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. That was a great presentation. We really enjoyed it. Uh, it is the question and answer time. So if people would like to ask some questions, uh, you are welcome to just put it into the uh, Q&A area on your screen. Um, we'll give you a few minutes to do it. I know there's a little bit of a delay, so um, it may take a few minutes for people to start uh, giving in their questions here. Oh, not quite as much of a delay as I thought. We've got one that's coming in. <laughs> Um, we have one question here that says, a device can be safe but not cost effective. Who in Brazil determines cost and medical effectiveness outcomes for research, evaluations, quality, and consumer education? Thank you so much for this very interesting question. This is a subject of debate here because uh, cost effectiveness is something that is uh, very important to anyone, right? But uh, on the other hand, there are some costs related to uh, the assurance of cost effectiveness. No, so it's not uh, uh, possible for all those institutions to perform this kind of analysis. So uh, each uh, institution which provides the benefit performs its own analysis of cost effectiveness. For instance, when we provide some credit to a healthcare equipment uh, company, we ourselves analyze if uh, the credit is taken in order to improve cost effectiveness. Whenever the ministries uh, provide a tax benefit, they themselves they analyze this from the perspective of the benefit granted. So each uh, institution is responsible for, for performing those uh, evaluations regarding their specific activities. Unfortunately, this leads the, to the question on what, if there is someone taking care of the whole. And uh, uh, that's a difficult question. Also, the Ministry of Health, in this case, is responsible for looking after all the process. But uh, since it takes so many, so much information, it is really difficult to perform it in a systemically way, in a systemic way, right? I hope to have, have, have answered that one. Um, this next question, I like how it's, how it's asked. Um, how do you think the US moved from our version, a healthcare train wreck, to Brazil's version, a healthcare ecosystem? Oh, that's a very subtle question also. I don't know much about 
the, the American uh, 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 rules and regulations. I know, I keep hearing from friends that it is similar to the Brazilian rules, but put in different ways sometimes. So I'm not in condition, I'm, I'm not able to develop, uh, develop this kind of analysis any more than uh, having those impressions collected from uh, colleagues in the industry and in other uh, uh, government institutions, that they are very similar. Okay, very good. Um, this next one is a follow-up to that first question we had. Who determines in Brazil best practices to be used? In the U.S., we have evidence-based medicine, which determines best practices to avoid abuses. Yeah, another good, very good question. Uh, I, I would have to be a, a healthcare specialist to answer this one, but uh, I, I think um, each agency again performs its own uh, analysis. For instance, in what regards good uh, production practices, it is the responsibility of the health uh, registration agency here in Visa to ensure that. And uh, evidence-based uh, science is something that should be uh, uh, searched, uh, should be uh, uh, pursued. And uh, we hope to keep this practice, but we understand also, even as uh, uh, public institutions or uh, their managers, their decision makers, that there is uh, a trade-off analysis in that regard. Also, you should do evidence-based analysis. As soon as you can ensure the amount of resource, resources to perform those analyses, and uh, to balance the need with the resources available, right? So each institution is responsible for uh, uh, its own part in the process. Do we have more questions? Well, the next one is not really a question. It's more of a shout out from your fan club. It's like, it says, Carlos is one of the best speakers in Brazil. <laughs> Excellent arguments and content. Thank you. Thank you so much for this comment. I see here there are some friends posting some uh, uh, comments and some observations. I, I wish to thank you all for being so kind. Um, if there are any other questions, please feel free to ask them. We'll go on for a few more minutes. I know that uh, Dr. Duarte has uh, some meetings to get to soon, but uh, if you guys have any questions, feel free to ask them. We'll give you a couple of a more minutes or so. We'll let the delay catch up to us and <laughs> that if uh... it's interesting while people make their uh, questions, it's important to, to, to make reference to those uh, previous uh, questions I received. They were not so related to the specifics of what I presented. They were more general questions and their concerns of all the Brazilians, or at least a great majority of the Brazilians here. And of course, uh, we, we should strive to use the best uh, techniques to achieve those goals, to keep good practices, to use evidence-based methods and so on. Well, it looks like we don't have any more uh, questions coming in right now, and I know you've got to leave very soon. So um, I think that, uh, you know, it's been great having you on here. It's been wonderful having you speak, the content and everything, just as our, our last uh, person posting said, was, was really great. We really enjoyed having you, and you're, you know, a wonderful um, distinguished visitor. So thank you very much for this. I'd also like to thank all of our uh, attendees for coming. We really have enjoyed having you here and having the questions come in. 
Um, in addition to the Distinguished Lecturer webinar series, we also have Build Your Career webinar series, and that focuses more on business soft skills, such as communications, presentation skills, career transition, uh, interviewing tips, among others. Our next Build Your Career webinar will be on the 20th of August at 11 a.m. U.S. Eastern Time on the online presenter, and that'll be presented by Elas uh, Elsa Velasco-Paul. She's the founder of the M&E Group. Registration for this event is now open, and we'll be sending you a link to this uh, and future events, um, along with the slides and the recording of this webinar. Again, Dr. Duarte, thank you very much. We've really enjoyed having you. Thank you so much, Kerry. I look forward to other uh, events of the Distinguished uh, Visitor Program. And uh, I wish also to thank you and to Scott, which was also together with us in this webinar. Thank you all. Goodbye. All right, thank you. Bye.